it seems very logical and it seems, of course, what's wrong with two people loving each other? But here's something very important. Love does not equal sex. The Bible never talks about that the two are the same. As a matter of fact, uh, the Bible, you know, if there's two main things that we can pull out of the Bible from the Old Testament and the New Testament that the Bible really elevates as, a, as sin that is probably mentioned the most out of any other sins. First of all, it's idolatry. Second of all, it's sexual immorality. Welcome to Biblical Diman, and today our guest is Dr. Christopher Yuan, who taught the Bible at Moody Bible Institute for over 12 years and his speaking ministry on faith and sexuality have reached five continents. He has co-authored with his mother, their memorial, Out of a Far Country, A Gay Son's Journey to God, A Broken Mother's Search for Hope, and 100,000 uh, copies sold and now in seven languages. He's the author of Giving a Voice to the Voiceless, Dr. Yuan's newest book, Holy Sexuality and the Gospel, was named 2020 book of the year for social issues by outreach magazine and it is my joy to have you here sir well it's a joy for me to be on with you rajat yeah thank you and uh, i know your testament is very interesting uh, i've heard uh, your testament so for our viewers tell us your about yourself and how did you come to know jesus i wasn't raised in a christian home so we have that in common we I did not know Christ for most of, or all of my youth, all of my young adult years. And, um, but, uh, you know, like, like you, I'm, I'm not, uh, I'm not Caucasian and being in America, we are a minority. So uh, I wrestled with my identity, but I also wrestled with something that I kept secret. I didn't tell anyone, you know, Asians, we are, very private. We don't talk about uh, personal matters, especially issues of sex or sexuality. So I, the first time I remember having same-sex attractions when I, was when I came across pornography. And the interesting thing is, you know, you would think, oh, you know, it must have been one of your American friends who, who, who gave you pornography. Actually, it wasn't. It was one of my trusted uh, family friends, friends of my parents. My parents had no idea. The father kept it hidden. In the, in the bathroom, I was friends with uh, their son and I just found it, you know, nine years old. I, you know, that's, it was, I know parents, you, you know, if you're listening now, you might be devastated, but we have to realize in our age of internet, pornography is everywhere. And if there's internet in the United States, there's internet in India, and if children, whether it's on the computer or whether it's on their phone, are have this powerful tool in their hands that can do good but there's also a lot of harm to it as well and so i would really urge parents if you are listening or even if you're a young adult to be very wise and careful with the internet intake that we have if you have a child i you know i mean it's maybe not the same thing in india but in america uh, you have little kids walking around with their own cell phones uh, smartphones and I, to me i don't think that that's necessary i think children just need a flip phone you know something very very simple and they don't need access to the internet at any moment of the, of the day but anyway so i was exposed to pornography at 9 years old which is actually though young at that time i'm i'm 50 years old so i was born in 1970 so at that time that might have been young i don't i don't think so because i think that's that's kind of kids are exposed very young and especially today they're being exposed even younger because of internet and also because of parents just allowing children to be to have access 24 hours a day on the internet we really need to limit that i think uh, but so i was exposed to pornography i didn't tell anyone kept my feelings hidden i definitely didn't tell my parents Kept that hidden through high school, college, Marine Corps reserves. Uh, I came out of the closet. I was going to dental school. My father's a dentist and I was wanted to pursue being a dentist. So I was pursuing my doctorate in dentistry. I was in my 20s at this time. I was, I'm from Chicago. I, I was moved to Louisville, Kentucky, which is central in the United States uh, in the South. Fairly conservative, but it was then that I came out of the closet, as, as we say, as I said back then. I told my parents, and amazingly, this is the best part, Rajat, that my through that crisis, devastated my mom and dad, but it brought my mom to faith. 
well, I wanted nothing to do with what I saw as crazy religion. You know, who's this God? Who believes in that? And especially I thought, well, Christians hate gays. And, and I thought, well, this is who I am. So Christians hated me. So I rejected their religion. I thought they, you know, lost their mind. And I, at that time, I kept doing what I knew how to do best, which was have fun. You know, if you don't have God, then you might as well have fun, live it up, party with my friends. And I did that. I began experimenting with drugs. And, and I, I need to make this clear because sometimes people think that I'm saying that everyone who's gay or lesbian does drugs or promiscuous. Not necessarily true. Some do, some don't. But that definitely is part of my story. And I just have to tell my story and, you know, talk about God's glorious work in my life. But I began experimenting with drugs. But if anyone would guess, drugs cost money. So I actually supported my habit by selling drugs while in dental school. I sold to friends, classmates, even a professor. Well, eventually, I was expelled from dental school. I moved from Louisville, Kentucky, further down south to Atlanta, which is around the southeast uh, in Georgia. And at that time, I kept doing what I knew how to do best, which was sell drugs, have fun. And I began supplying drugs. This whole time, my parents had no clue that, that I was doing drugs, but they knew that my biggest need was not to stop doing drugs because they didn't even know, know I did that or stop partying. They knew even my biggest problem was not my sexuality. They knew my biggest problem was that I did not surrender to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. So they began to pray for a miracle. Um, well, actually, they came to visit me one time in Atlanta, and I told them to get out. I, it was so bad. I mean, I, I hate to think about this, you know, because, you know, Asians, we're supposed to respect our parents. But in my mind, I kept telling myself, I'm not Chinese. I'm, I'm American, which is so funny how Satan likes to twist things. So I, I rejected them. I, they came to visit me. I, I kicked them out. And uh, my dad, before he left, gave me his Bible. And as soon as they left, I took my dad's Bible and I threw it in the trash can. That's how much I despised God and the Bible. And after that visit, it was so obvious to my parents that I was hopeless, completely unreachable. But my mom and dad committed not to focus upon hopelessness, but upon the promises of God. And along with over 100 prayer warriors from their church, from their Bible study fellowship group, they began to cry out to God for me. My mom began to pray a bold prayer. God, do whatever it takes, whatever it takes to bring this prodigal son to you. For, for an Asian mother, that's a scary prayer to pray. But she was desperate, and she enlisted over 100 prayer warriors to, fa to pray and fast. She fasted every Monday for seven years, once fasted 39 days on my behalf. She would literally spend hours every single morning in a prayer closet, reading the Bible, interceding for me. I mean, it was, she knew there was going to take a miracle to bring this prodigal son to the father. And a miracle is exactly what God did. That came with a bang on my door, opened up my door, and on my doorstep were 12 federal drug enforcement agents, Atlanta police, and two big German shepherd dogs. So I received a, a, a shipment of drugs, not my largest, but they confiscated my money, my drugs, and I was charged with the equivalent of 9.1 tons of marijuana. So I was called, uh, I found myself in jail and I called home just thinking, I'm gonna get an earful for my mom. But my mother's first words were, are you okay? No condemnation, just words of unconditional love and grace. A couple, couple of days after that, um, I was walking around the cell block and I passed by this garbage can and I thought, this is my life, trash. I've destroyed my life. I bent over and, and, I, and I thought, and there was something on top of the trash. I picked it up and it was a Gideon's New Testament. I took it back to my cell, began reading it. And at first it wasn't good news. It wasn't giving, making me happy. It was actually bad news because I'm a sinner. And it was telling me I've sinned against God. I've sinned against my parents. I sinned against my, the, the government. And I was like, what is, what's the good in this? Well, things got worse. I was called to the nurse's office. And the nurse gave me the news that I was HIV positive. So I was devastated. And one night I was found myself in my cell all by myself. And I looked up at the metal bunk above me. It was all, you know, it was cold metal. And someone had written, if you're bored, read Jeremiah 29, 11. For I know the plans that I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you hope in the future. And God used those words written to a prophet thousands of years ago to condemn a rebellious nation, Israel, that was in rebellion 
in exile to tell me that he could still have, God could still have a plan for me while I was in prison as a rebel. And I didn't know where that plan was going to take me, but he gave me enough faith and enough strength to get through that one day and the next and the next. So my transformation was gradual. God, God was convicting of my sin, obviously drugs, but in a few months, he, conv- he delivered me from that addiction. God kept bringing my other idols, and there was one that I felt like I just couldn't let go of, and it was my sexuality. So I went to a chaplain, and I asked him his opinion. And to my surprise, the chaplain told me, oh, the Bible doesn't condemn homosexuality. Gave me a book explaining that view. And so with much curiosity, I took that book in the hopes of finding biblical justification for homosexuality. I had that book in one hand and the Bible in the other. And Rajat, let me just tell you, from a purely human perspective, I had every reason in the world to accept what that book is claiming to justify the way I had been living. But I know now that it was God's indwelling Holy Spirit that convicted me that that those assertions from that book were a clear distortion of God and his word. I couldn't even finish that book, and I gave it back to the chaplain. So I turned to the Bible alone. I went through every verse, every chapter, every page of scripture looking for anything that would bless a monogamous same-sex relationship. I couldn't find any. So I was at this turning point, and a decision had to be made. Either abandon God and his word, live as a gay man, pursue a monogamous same-sex relationship by allowing my attractions to dictate not only who I was, but how I lived. Or abandon pursuing a monogamous same-sex relationship by freeing myself from my sexuality and live as a follower of Jesus Christ. My decision was clear and obvious. I followed Jesus. As the days and months of abstinence passed, I realized my sexuality shouldn't be the core of who I, who I am. I told myself before, God loves me unconditionally, and that's true. But as, sinner, as a sinner, I'd, I'd, I'd like to add to God's, God's word. And, and, and you know, we often add to God's word, which is wrong. And I told myself, so therefore, God doesn't want me to change. But I realized that actually unconditional love is not the same thing as unconditional approval of my behavior. My identity shouldn't be defined by my sexuality. My identity shouldn't be grounded in my desires. My identity is not gay. It is not ex-gay. It's not even heterosexual for that matter because my identity as a child of the living God must be in Jesus Christ alone. God says, be holy for I am holy. You know, I thought that the option of homosexuality was heterosexuality, that somehow that was the goal to be heterosexual. But as I studied it more, I realized, first of all, that's not even a word in the Bible. Also, it's a secular concept grounded in Sigmund Freud's philosophy. And I thought, this is not the goal, because being heterosexual, I could be sinning even as a heterosexual, heterosexual sin. So I realized that heterosexuality, it's the correct direction, but it's too broad and not specific enough about God's holy intention. God never com- commands us be heterosexual for I am heterosexual, but neither did he say be homosexual for I am homosexual. Instead, God says be holy for I am holy. So therefore, the opposite of homosexuality is not heterosexuality, but the opposite of homosexuality is holiness. As a matter of fact, the opposite of every sin is holiness. I don't need to focus upon whether I'm struggling, whether I'm tempted, but I need to focus upon living a life of holiness and living a life of purity because change is not the absence of temptations, but change is the spirit wrought ability to be holy even in the midst of temptations because the ultimate issue is not whether I'm struggling or tempted, but the ultimate issue is that I yearn after God in total surrender in complete obedience. So after a few, uh, about a, you know, some time passed in prison, I realized that, that God called me to full-time ministry. So I, I applied to uh, Moody Bible Institute. Actually, God shortened my sentence from three years, six years to three years. I applied to Moody Bible Institute, um, and I was actually uh, accepted. I, uh, I was released from prison in July of 2001, started the very next month in August at Moody, and then went on to my master's, and finally my doctorate, and then wrote my first book, out of a far country with my mother, and then the second book, uh, or my uh, actually my third book, uh, called Holy Sexuality and the Gospel. Wow, that's so wonderful to hear! Really, really amazing. I heard it now. This is the second time I'm hearing it, and I was really blessed as I heard it for the first time. So, thank you so mm-hmm. much, Doctor uh, Yo, and that how God used you, how you were a prisoner, now you're a preacher. And through your condition, through by your, God's grace, yeah, through your uh, iniquity, 
or your behavior, your mother came into faith and yes. your whole family got saved. That's really nice Amen. to see. Amen. Amen. So we see as, you know, you were struggling with the sexuality, but on the other hand, we see the gender identity, you know, we clearly yes. know that in the, in the book of Genesis, God created male and female. Yes. And uh, now we have the transgenders and eunuch also. So what does the Bible say about gender equality? Yes. Well, so it's understanding how words change over time. Maybe 10 years ago, 20 years ago, uh, gender was only a term used for linguistics. In other words, um, now I'm not too sure about the languages in India. Um, uh, what is it? What are some of the in, uh, Urdu or Punjab? Right? What the, all the other, I mean, there's lots of languages. I know Chinese, there's, there's no gender in, in our language. Uh, in English, we don't really have gender. I'm just talking about the, the language. Now, German, French, Latin, Greek, those Germanic or those, you know, more European languages, uh, French, I don't know if I said that or not, but those do have uh, a masculine gender and a feminine, feminine gender and also a neuter gender. That's just the way that, so their words... Um, uh, I'm trying to think of an example, like maybe in Spanish, but you know, the, the endings often. And so pronouns need to then match the gender of the noun. Doesn't mean like, like a ship could be maybe a uh, feminine gender in French. That doesn't like make the ship actually a woman, but it's just the way that the words work. So the term gender was basically used in the realm of linguistics Sometimes when it was used elsewhere to refer to people, it was synonymous with sex. So when we talk about sex, male and female, we thought about the same thing. Sex meaning a physical characteristic you can tell by objectively, by uh, whether doing a blood test, DNA test, or looking at one's physical organs. Of course, there's the issue of intersex, but that's an anomaly. An anomaly in medicine never negates the, the binary system, never even though today people think that, but these are not med medical doctors who are saying that for, for sure. Realize that people who says that there's, you know, there's many sexes, it's not med medical doctors who are saying that, it's all you know, activists. But anyway, so now gender has, has kind of uh, took on this new term that's no longer synonymous with sex, biological sex or physical sex. Gender now has become not an objective reality like sex, but a subjective reality, which is what I think, what I feel. So whereas sex is biological, gender now is psychological. Sex is objective, gender is, is now subjective, meaning what I feel, what I think, that by, by definition is, is, um, is uh, subjective. So as you say, Rajat, the, in Genesis chapter 1, verse, verse 27, which is uh, the chapter on the Imago Dei, we have, uh, it's, it's a foundational verse from which, you know, the Bible builds. You know, of course, then we have Genesis 3, the fall. So we have the wonderful aspect of uh, humanity, the pinnacle of God's creation, who's created in God's image. No, nothing else is in God's image not, uh, no angels, no animals, nothing is created in God's image except for humanity, except for man. And then, you know, there's a lot of questions about what exactly is the image of God. And, and there's a lot of discussion here. But the one thing that we can definitely say that is very closely linked and correlated with the Imago Dei is male and female, nothing else. I mean, it, it's a very simple passage, Genesis 1, verse 20. I mean, it's actually poetry. That's why when you read it in your Bibles or see in your Bibles, it see, you, you see it bracketed off um, as poetry. And it talks about in the beginning, uh, or it says, so God created man in his own image. That's line one of the, po of, of kind of the, uh, we call that like a, a tr um, I'm losing my, it's a line in poetry. Um, they call it a colon. colon. Uh, in the image of God, he created him, male and female, he created them. So it's uh, th the reality of sex, male and female, is very closely linked with the Im Imago Dei. So therefore, sex is not just biological. It's not, it's not um, a psychological reality, but it's not just biological. Christians, sometimes we, 
we overemphasize the physical aspect. It is. But from this passage, we actually find that male and female is a spiritual reality. Imago Dei is not just a physical reality. It's holistic. It's everything. It's also spiritual, but it's not only spiritual. It's, it's everything. All that we are, we're not just separated beings. We're, we're a physical being and a spiritual being. We're, we're one. I mean, yes, we have those aspects, but we are all one. So therefore, male and female is definitely linked to that. And today, what we find is that there's just a blurring of the lines. Satan being the prince of lies, what he does best is blur the lines. And, and if you have my book, I, I, I don't have my book next to me, but um, it, the, the cover is black and white, holy sexuality and the gospel. Uh, and it might look kind of very simple, but I was very intentional about my book cover because we're living in a world of infinite gr uh, shades of gray. I, I'm sure, Rajat, you heard of the, the, uh, the, the secular book called 50 Shades of Gray. And, you know, it's, unfortunately had been super popular in the United States. And, and, and that's so much representative of what we're living today. Everything's gray, nothing, you know, we just don't know. And that's what we hear today. And as apologists, it's frustrating because no, we know, you know, truth is not gray. Truth is black and white, particularly when it comes to biblical sexuality, it's black and white. Same thing with gender. Gender is not just gray. Gender is black and white. There's male and female, and certainly there are anomalies like intersex, but in those cases, it's very small, but anomalies in medicine never negate binary systems. Wow, that's a pretty interesting uh, information, and uh, really, it's uh, really insightful to know that, uh, that male and female, I mean, the language becomes the barrier to identify the gender, to identify the agenda, right? But yes, God has created us in his own image, that is male and female, maybe uh, physically we can see, but also spiritually we are male and female. Uh, yes. Right? Yes. And, and, it, and that doesn't then make then that God is male or female, but uh, he's, he's actually above male and female. Right. He's created, I mean, like, you know, the pagan uh, gods as, 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 you know, I know being in China and in India, there's a lot of pagan gods that take on either male form or masculine or yes. female form or whatever, but God is not. He's not male or female, but the imago Dei and the represent, representation of it, it's not that male or female necessarily represents it, but it is, it is very closely linked and correlated with uh, the image of God. And it's important to note that human beings were made in the image of God. That doesn't mean that we are the image of God. The only one that is the image of God is Jesus Christ himself. Therefore, we as believers, even though we're created in the image of God, we also have a distorted human nature, a sinful human nature that then, you know, almost competes there in conflict with one another. And as we come to Christ, this aspect of our sinfulness, our sinful nature is being redeemed by Christ and the Holy Spirit is helping to suppress that. And that helps us to be more like the image of God, be more like Christ because of Christ's work in us. Yes, absolutely true. Absolutely true. So I want to take this, uh, uh, this topic to further now to the sexuality as you found yourself uh, gay and you told your mom, about your homosexuality. So I want to ask that are people born homosexuals or they mm. become? Great question. And, and, and I'm glad that you're asking this question, particularly about terminology. You know how I began uh, be, uh, you know, talking about sex and gender, and I talk a little about uh, vocabulary and words. Same way, when it comes to this topic of sexuality, words matter. And, and uh, why, why do words matter? I mean, we're in Genesis, right? How did God create? He spoke and things came into existence. So, you know, words are powerful. God's words are powerful. You know, one aspect of being like God is that we can communicate. We use words. We, we can communicate through the written word. We can communicate through this. Uh, I'm sorry. We can communicate through the spoken word. We can communicate through the written word. And uh, just like God does as well. And so I, I've learned as a minister is that I also need to be very careful the words that I speak and how I even talk about myself. So for example, the term gay, and, and, and this is very difficult as, as I often minister with people 
who, who are in China and uh, they email me, you know, so across the seas, they email. And, and by the way, if, if there are any listeners and they do have questions and they, and they want to further, they can contact me on the website and, at, you know, ask me a question. Because uh, a lot of times people feel alone, and, you know, particularly in, in Asia and China, where they think they can't share with anyone, you know, their pastor will never understand. And maybe that's true. Maybe it's not. Uh, but then they, they reach out. And in Chinese, there's not a lot of words that, that can explain what they are. And so in Chinese, they just say, I am gay. And in English, I used to say that, but I no longer say that because that term gay, though in the past, my, remember, Rajat, you know this probably 200 years ago, gay meant happy, right? It doesn't mean that anymore. We, when we say gay now, it, you know, there's a whole different meaning behind that. Sometimes, though, people like to simplify what words mean or try to limit the scope of their definition. So on the very surface level, gay might just mean a person who has same-sex attractions. But because gay, lesbian, LGBTQ has become so politicized to the point where even to participate in the United Nations now, you have to now, what, advocate for gay rights, which I think is ridiculous. I mean, why are we trying to westernize the whole world? I think that's the worst thing. We should not westernize the whole world. We need to Christianize the whole world, but not, not make them like the West, because the West has, has, is going in the wrong direction. Uh, but so, so the, the, the goal is, you know, we, we need to be more like Christ. And so that term gay Yes, on the surface, it might mean like the first layer might mean a person who has same such attractions, but there are these multiple layers of meaning that that come with simply the term gay. And the main thing that I ob object with is that gay has been closely linked with who you are. And uh, so I think that, uh, you know, the and this is problematic, where it also comes to this question that he said, are people born gay? Because we think about gay less of an experiential reality. You know, so if you have any apologists here, it's an existential reality. It's about what we experience. It's about what we feel, what we do, behavior. You know, existentialism is about kind of, you know, creating meaning and purpose and doing things, you know, in your life because there is no meaning. So that's, you know, gay has become not only this kind of, uh, no, gay no longer is so much about what we do or feel, gay has become who I am. And I think that's the first error that we make. Even as Christians, we view this as, oh, this is who a person is, not what a person feels. And I, as I say in my book, sexuality is not who you are, it's how you are. There's a big difference. So the question that you ask about are people born gay? Well, looking at all the research even, you know, we assume that the science has already been out and uh, we've already proven that people are born gay. But the reality is even the most recent study in 2019 that came out on genetics and sexuality revealed that even genetics, I mean, first of all, it revealed that we don't know what's the cause. If we won't, don't know what the causes are, then we don't know whether people are born gay. Because you have to first figure out what are the causative factors? What's the contributing factors to someone developing a certain trait? And then you're able to then say, oh, well, people are, are, are born gay. But if we don't even know what are the causative factors or even can determine whether a person has that trait or not objectively, not subjectively by self-declaration, then we cannot determine or fig even figure out whether people are born gay. But anyway, so this research that looks on whether genetics plays a role, they were only able to find five markers. And this is the largest genetic study ever done. There's a combination between researchers in England and United States, and they look at all these gene pools, um, you know, because it's a popular thing now to, to find a, like your ancestry and you kind of do a DNA test and all that. And so the reality is they take that information. I mean, there's always an ulterior motive and they're taking that information and keeping in their database and they're doing research on it, which I don't know. I mean, I don't know where's the ethical standards in that, but that's neither here. That could be a whole other talk. But the reality is there's these, uh, because it's so popular, there are tons and tons of people putting in their genes and genetics to kind of get these tests, but these people keep the information and then they're doing kind of, you know, uh, statistical analysis on it. So, they, they are finding out that they only found five possible DNA markers, not five possible genes, but DNA markers. And of those added together are less than 1%. So genetics plays a very small role. And to date, we don't know what are all the factors. 
And I, I don't, you know, I honestly don't think that we will ever be able to figure out what are the actual factors. I think it's multifaceted. I don't think we will ever prove that people are born gay. But here's, the, here's something very interesting, Rajat. The Bible is our guide, period. And oftentimes, it answers way more questions than we think. And it answers this question, whether people are born gay, the correct way. Because even though people think they're born gay or born transgender, whatever, whatever you, they want to say, Jesus Christ says in John chapter 3 to Nicodemus, you must be born again. Absolutely. So whether you think you were born gay or whether you think you're born an alcoholic or whether you think you're born a liar or a cheater, you must be born again. The old is gone. The new has come. You and Christ are a new creation. And that's good news for everyone. Wonderful. Wonderful to hear that. And uh, from your experience as well, uh, I mean, uh, yes, we even we do not know how it happens and maybe environmental facts or maybe you were born and brought up into that situations. Uh, we do not know, but we definitely know that, uh, uh, that, that the language barrier you said that uh, the being gay in the 2000 bags must be a happy man, right. but now it has related with the sexuality. Yes. I often just, instead of saying I am gay, I might just, explain the reality that I'm, I have the, I experience same sex attractions. I think that's much more accurate about what it is as opposed to I am gay. Mm -hmm. Yes. So um, we see that Bible is very clear to call homos homosexuality a sin. It is a yes. sinful act, right? But the people, those who are indulged in it, they call it love. Mm -hmm. Bible also speaks about love, but why does Bible opposes such love? Great question, Rajad. It's probably one of the most common questions. I mean, you may have heard it. It's, it's kind of like a, a saying here in the United States, love is love. Or people will say, what's wrong with two people loving each other? And I mean, it seems, it seems very logical. And it seems, of course, what's wrong with two people loving each other? But here's something very important. Love does not equal sex. The Bible never talks about that the two are the same. As a matter of fact, uh, the Bible... You know, if there's two main things that we can pull out of the Bible from the Old Testament and the New Testament that the Bible really elevates as, a, as sin that is probably mentioned the most out of any other sins. First of all, it's idolatry. Second of all, it's sexual immorality. Those two are, it's unanimously spoken against in scripture. So uh, simply to say, and I mean, and even, you know, the Bible even talks about wrong love. Samson, you know, he said, I love Delilah. Did he really love Delilah? I mean, in, in the way that we're meant to love, you know, of course, that was written in the Old Testament in Hebrew, but in the New Testament in Greek, we have the word agape love. Hebrew only has one word and it's ahava. But in, in Greek, we have different types of love. In English, I don't know about uh, in India, the, the different words for love. But in English, there's only you know, one term for love, and it's love. And so because of that, it kind of takes on you know, the, uh, a broader meaning. In Greek, they have different, like for example, eros, ero like where we get erotic. Eros is kind of more the sexual love. Uh, phileo love, where we get the word uh, like more brotherly love. And then we have agape love, which is like unconditional love. Those are all the terms in Greek that they use. Um, so th the important thing is, it's not the love that's wrong. It's the sex that wrong. And when I say love, I'm not talking about romantic love either, because then people are like, oh, then, then it's okay for two men to love each other. And they're thinking like in a loving, romantic kind of marriage type of way. No, because love, and, and, and oftentimes I tell my unbelieving friends this, that actually Christians, we don't have a narrow, closed-minded understanding of love. The world does. They think love only happens or it's the most deepest or best form of love is in marriage. No, our understanding of love is much broader than that. That love between a mother and a child, father, I mean, we have a brother and a brother, friend and a friend. These can be very deep, life-giving, intimate, joyful, loving relationships that have nothing to do with sex, have nothing to do with uh, romance, you know, what's the greatest commandment? 
Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. That does not mean that we should marry God or have sex with God. Nothing sexual or romantic there, right? I mean, it's ludicrous to think that. And then what's the second greatest commandment that Jesus says? Love your neighbor as yourself. Again, nothing in there that implies that we should marry our neighbor as we would marry ourselves, right? I mean, it's, it's ludicrous the way to even think of that or even anything sexual. So even the greatest commandments that is about love does not have any context or implication that is talking about marriage or romance. But what does the world say? That it's, you know, love and, and, and they talk, you know, uh, Valentine's Day. I don't know if that's something that's celebrated in India, but, you know, Americans, they love their holidays because then it's, I don't know, another opportunity to spend more money. It's, I think it's a little silly sometimes. But so they have, you know, Valentine's Day, which just passed February 15th or February 14th, whatever. So I don't, I don't celebrate it that much because I'm single, so it doesn't matter. But uh, so Valentine's Day you know, I love you, or they say, you know, I, I heart you. And, and love, what does that mean? It's linked to romance. It's linked to, you know, kind of sexual intimacy. And, and yet the Bible talks about something even greater. I mean, what's the greatest love? God's love for us. And again, nothing romantic about that. So uh, it's, it's, it's not that love, agape, unconditional love is wrong between two. If two men loved each other and there was no romantic involvement, just agape love, loving one another as a brother would love a brother, there's nothing wrong with that. But once it becomes romantic or like exclusive or sexual, that is when the Bible calls that sin. Because anything outside of marriage between a man and a woman and the only definition for marriage that we have which, which Jesus very clearly articulates, I think the best apologetic for marriage is found in Matthew 19 and Mark chapter 10, where Jesus talks about divorce and schools them by pointing back to Genesis about what marriage is. It's between a man and a woman and the two shall become one flesh. So, uh, so anyway, this, this understanding of, of, of marriage and um, uh, you know, it, it helps us tie, tie us back to scripture. Yeah, wonderful, wonderful to hear that. That love, that world says love is love, but Bible is very uh, clear that uh, love one another, but love is not associated with sex only. Right? Yes. Yeah, so world has distorted, distorted the meaning of the love. So it's very yes. interesting to know that. And and you have written the book on this, Holy Sexuality and the Gospel. Uh, yes. This, this, yeah. So what is the motivation uh, behind writing this? Yeah, well, it, it, but the motivation behind writing this was realizing that there's, as Christians, we've pigeonholed ourselves, meaning uh, we've kind of forced ourselves into this paradigm. And what's that paradigm? It's the homosexual, heterosexual, bisexual paradigm. And we think that's the only way for us to think about or the only categories that we have to think about sexuality, you know a person is either homosexual or they're bisexual or heterosexual. But I was frustrated with that because with that framework, I thought, well, then what is it that God is calling us to? It's not homosexuality. It's not bisexuality. So then I'm sorry, then is it automatically heterosexuality? And again, thinking through this, as I said earlier, heterosexuality is so broad that includes sinful behavior. I could be a man sleeping with 12 women. That's considered heterosexual. And unfortunately, I know some Christian men that would celebrate that, like with their sons. Well, at least he's not gay. No, that's sin. <laughs> that's pure sin. And, and if we're celebrating that, then we're also celebrating sin. Um, I could be cheating on my wife with another woman, committing adultery, and that's considered heterosexual. I could be an unmarried man, and I'm maybe living with my girlfriend or something, and, and we have a few children together. That's also considered heterosexual, but sinful. And, and as Christians, we always need to be very precise with the words. Words matter. And I, I want, I, I, it, so this book came out of my frustration with realizing this paradigm is secular, it's Freudian, meaning it's, you know, Sigmund Freud. Uh, who kind of popularized this, the, the concept, and we needed a biblical one. And I, and I realized that God, there's only two, two standards that God holds out for us. That is, to, when you are single, you're going to be abstinent, sexually abstinent. When you are married, you're going to be faithful to your spouse. So it's, holy sexuality is either chastity and singleness or faithfulness in marriage. And what I wanted to do was build out this theology of sexuality because it's, it's, it's not, biblical sexuality is not what we should not do. Because we can't build a Christian life on God's no. We have to build a Christian life on what is God's yes. 
So I wrote this book and, and this is what, you know, I introduced this concept in my first book out of our country and I always knew that I needed to kind of fill it out. So that's, that's why I wrote this new book. So you can show your book, Holy Sexuality and the Gospel. Okay, great. Okay, so this is... And, and I think that you can uh, get this maybe on Kindle, probably the easiest, easiest. And, uh, but uh, both books are, are also... Uh, the other one is out of a far country. I should have gotten that as well, but I forgot. <laughs> it's okay. in the other room. Oh, it's yeah. okay. So, great. So, you have included chapters, two chapters on uh, marriage. So, as yes. we defend the sanct uh, sanctity of biblical marriage between a male, uh, between a man and a woman... So have we gotten a few things wrong? So what is the ultimate purpose of marriage? Well, definitely what we get right is God's truth, that marriage is between a man and a woman. And there's really no way that, you know, again, that, that's why I talk about my book, you know, is, it's black and white. It's, there's no gray. There's no question. Jesus didn't, was not kind of implying somehow that there are more uh, understandings of what marriage is. It's, it's clearly between a man and a woman. And even Jesus was rooting it, not even in the law, he's ro rooting it in, in God's creation. Um, so what we, when I say get wrong, I think people get, especially Christians get nervous. I, I'm not at all saying that the definition of marriage is wrong. What I'm saying is what we get wrong as Christians is how we view marriage. And I'm going to speak, at least from my context, being Chinese, the, there's a lot of, for, in our Chinese culture, and, and, I'm, and I'm guessing it's probably similar in Indian culture, there is an enormous emphasis on marriage. It's good, but I'm saying enormous, to the point where there's pressure among young adults who maybe finish school or whatever, they get to that age of 20, that there's this enormous pressure to get married because, married because if you don't, then somehow you won't be happy, you won't be complete, et cetera. And the reality, and, and, I'm, and I, I'm not saying that it is fairly normative that most people do marry, but I think that we we over sentimentalize marriage and don't really seek out what is God's will. Marriage is only right when it is aligned with God's will, because many times people could marry the wrong person or maybe even the wrong timing. And my emphasis about how we get this wrong is sometimes we're, we, we almost idolize marriage and treat it as if it's the only way to be happy. It's the only way to be complete. And that's not true. God doesn't actually want us to be happy. He wants us to be holy. And marriage is not the only means to be content. First of all, we should be content in Christ, whether we're single or whether we're married. And we don't become whole through another person. We only become whole in Christ. In Mark chapter, nine, uh, Mark chapter 10 and Matthew 19, Jesus says the two shall become one flesh. He didn't say the two halves become one. He said the two shall become one flesh, which is so important because I teach at Moody Bible Institute and I tell my students who are majority of them are single. I tell them before you become one in marriage, be whole in Christ. That's so important. Before you become one, be whole. Unfortunately, many Christians try to become whole by becoming one, but that's not how it works. Because if you try to become whole in marriage, all that happens is that marriage becomes a codependent mess. Instead, we need to be whole in Christ first and be confident in who we are in Christ. And that's the best way to prepare to be a good husband or to be a good wife. So I think that's one thing. I think sometimes we treat, you know, we idolize it. We also treat it as if it's the cure to loneliness, but actually many married people are still lonely. I believe the only true cure to loneliness is actually in, you know, grounded in our relationship and intimacy with Christ. So those are a few things that I think we get wrong, but I think that a lot that we get right, but we have to also as Christians be very critical of ourselves to see how is it that I might have a wrong thinking or something that is not aligned align with scripture and that we need to correct that and allow God to prune that away. Wow, that's, that's interesting. That's a new uh, insight for me to hear to get married that we need to we get whole in Christ first, then we have to become one flesh, right? Yes. That's yes. absolutely great. So uh, moving on to the, uh, the last question, I usually I, I ask every guest, what advice would you give to the young Christians that how to deal with homosexuality and homosexuals? 
Well, first of all, maybe I, I, let me address it in two ways. Maybe one for the individual might who, who might actually themselves struggle with same-sex attractions, but they, they are Christians and they're committed to following God and not acting on those. I want to kind of maybe give a few uh, encouraging words to them. But then I also want to say something for the rest who may not experience same-sex attractions, but they have a desire to seek and save the lost. So how would we reach out to those in the community that might identify as LGBT or they might, you know, whatever, act on it in, in, in a way. So two groups. And you might be a person right now, if you're, if you're watching Rajat and I and have this conversation, and maybe you, you, you have that, you know, and, and no one else knows, though. your family doesn't know, your community doesn't know, and you're scared. I want you to know this, you're not alone. The enemy, he wants us to feel like no one else understands you. You know, one of the best weapons of Satan is isolation. He wants to isolate us from everyone that can help us and walk with us and encourage us and point us to Jesus. So what he's doing is actually, um, you know, he's winning the Bible by, by making us believe the lie that no one understands you, that you're all alone. That's a lie. I would love for you to reach out to me. You know, I'm not next door to you. I'm not close to you in India, but, you know, email. I think a lot of people have email. Shoot me an email. And at least, you know, letting another person know is really helpful. I, I would encourage you, you know, to reach out to others. Rajat has such a big heart from what I've just, you know, gotten to know. And, and he has a desire for the, for the lost and to communicate truth and, and so I think seeking other people, even in your community, that, that understand the truth of God, but they also understand the grace of God. I think that's very important because sometimes people are either one way or the other. They're either lots of truth, but then they don't understand God's grace. But then you have others that are just all grace, you know, but then there's no truth or very little truth. So we have to not be truth at the expense of grace, not grace at the expense of truth, but like Jesus, John 1, 14, full of grace and full of truth. So I would encourage you to seek that out. But a few other things, um, do not identify, be identified by your attractions. I would not call yourself because oftentimes we talk to ourselves, right? I am this way, I'm that way. But we need to tell it, you know, no, this is not who I am. Yes, I might have these attractions and then, you know, I didn't ask for them. But remember, none of us asked to come from Adam. <laughs> none of us asked uh, or, or wanted to be impacted by the fall. That's just, there's just the reality, uh, you know, being human. So don't beat yourself up about it. You're no, no really different from anyone else. We're all sinners. We're all broken. We all need Christ, but don't feel like you're alone and don't identify by your sexuality. Now for others who maybe that's the rest of you watching and, and, and I'm going to guess maybe you're watching because you do, you have a heart and you say, you know what, the church, we have to improve. We have treated this as the worst sin. It's sin, but it's not the worst sin. There's a difference. And I want to see my neighbor or my coworker or maybe my nephew or cousin who identifies as LGBTQ, uh, I want them to come to know Christ. I mean, I, I even know in India, there's, I think there's this common practice of uh, men dressing up as women, uh, you know, it's, and, and it's kind of a big cultural thing. They need Jesus. Even these they're created in the image of God. That, that's what's so amazing, that God didn't just limit which human beings are created in God's image. Every individual, even the transgender person, even the homosexual activist, they're all created in God's image. But you know, the goal is, is that we want to point them to Christ so that they will not just be created in God's image, but they will be sons and daughters of God. We sometimes confuse those two. Sometimes we think image of God is the same being thing as child of God. No, that's not the way the Bible talks about it. Every human being is created in the image of God, but not every human being is a child of God. As Paul calls it, we were all children of wrath. And it's only through Jesus who then reconciles us to God that then God adopts us as sons and daughters, that then we become children of God only because of Jesus by grace through faith in Christ. 
So I would encourage us, you know, we need to, um, we need to do what we can and be intentional to reach out. And I know it might be countercultural. I know people are going to maybe talk, you know, you know, talk about you behind their back. What are, you know, what are they doing? They're talking to that, that person who's heathen or that person who's, who's gay. Well, you know, I often tell people, you know, we need to even invite people over for coffee or, or have dinner with them. And people think, but if I do that, am I condoning their sin? And again, that's a good question. But if we think about it, we usually have dinner with sinners, right? I mean, there's nothing new. We're, we're always eating with sinners. Eating with someone and sitting with someone is quite different. But we need to build a relationship to hopefully then have the context of friendship and trust to then be able to talk about our faith, just as we would reach out to maybe my Buddhist friend or maybe your, your Hindu friend or Muslim friend. We're not going to first go at them with truth. We're going to build a relationship with them and build trust and show them that I do care for you and I want to get to know you. And then it's in this context then that we can bring these apologetic truths that we have about the existence of God and not even talking about morality yet, because I think oftentimes as Christians, we want to go there first and we don't want to say, well, this is sin and I want to warn you, don't do this. And that's a, it's a good intention, but I think better than that, because that can turn them off. Better than that is to first talk about the existence of God and Jesus Christ. For example, if someone says, do you think homosexuality is sin? Well, that's kind of a, a debating stance. And, and, and sometimes Christians will then jump right in and be like, no, I don't. Well, then you kind of go back and forth. Well, that doesn't really expand. The, and let's just say I convince them that it's sin. At the end of the day, if they don't know Jesus, they're still lost. So instead, what you can do if they say, do you think this is sin? I would say, I know you don't even believe in God yet. So what does it matter what God thinks? So instead of talking about what God thinks, let's first talk about the existence of God. You see how I'm like, I'm turning the conversation right around to a very apologetic you know, conversation because that's what, when I have these conversations about the existence of God, his son, Jesus Christ, his word, that can lead to salvation. If I simply kind of have these conversations about morality, well, morality never saves anyone. So I, I want to deflect the more important question all the time. It's the more redemptive question that then helps us to point people to the salvific work of Jesus Christ. So really, the, the overall kind of theme is that we want to point people to Christ, not to just morality. And that means that we have to live that out first. I tell people, before you preach the gospel, which is so important, we need to live it. We have to live the gospel. Absolutely. Great advice that if you are struggling with your um, this uh, homosexuality or if you, you know, you don't know who to share. So I would suggest and I would highly recommend you reach out to Dr. Yuan. His website is in the link. Uh, his website link is in the description. And moreover, if you find someone who is uh, who is homosexual, lead them to Christ as Dr. Yuan has uh, advised us. So thank you so much, Dr. Uh, Christopher Yuan, for giving your time. It's great to be with you. It really is an honor. So nice to meet you, Rajat.